Welcome to tonight's video chat. My name is Cherie. My name is Chris. And we're Technomadia. Um, Eight years on the road. Uh, these are our monthly live video chats. This is being recorded live on October 9th, 2014. And uh, we do these uh, approximately every month when we have the bandwidth and time. And it's just a fun way for us to share on a topic and take some questions from our viewers. So what's the topic tonight? Tonight's topic is the realities of living in RV parks and campgrounds. Uh, right. Before we get started, of course, our big news is our book is done. This Actual is the Mobile Internet Handbook. It came out to 234 pages. Where's the uh, original? Oh, the small do, version? Do you have the, ver the version? It's up there uh, in the cabinet. Why don't you grab one? Okay. It's kind of cool. I don't think Anyway, this has been our project over the summer. We wrote this book. It is everything anyone, any RVer needs to know about getting online and staying online. It covers cellular, Wi-Fi, satellite, um, all the expectations. If you, we wrote the 2014 edition. It, you can see how tiny it is in the comparison. 2013. This, this, this felt epic creating that last year. And the updated version is... Yes, yeah, so it is, you can see, it is, <laughs> it, it really is, it was a total rewrite. We added a lot of content in it. Uh, if you haven't already gotten it, if you have gotten it, thank you. Thank you for doing it. Thank you if you supported us in our funding campaign. Um, you can now get this at rvmobileinternet.com. That is our brand new resource center for RV mobile internet information. And we actually just hosted a video chat on the, uh, all the double data plans. So uh, we... Uh, are, are doing some more in-depth stuff. Now the, I see people saying video flipped. I'm assuming they're meaning the yeah. text is backwards. That might just be a, the nature of this history. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, probably okay so. got it. Okay. Yeah. All righty. So let's get on to the talk about... Uh, it says flipped. Yeah, so so yeah, I think the, the just the Ustream is flipping things. We're not upside down what you mean by flipped, right? It's just the text on the book was flipped. Um, but it, it, okay. there's a two minute tape delay, so we can't get live answers from you guys. But um, I'm assuming that's what you mean, and um, okay. that's mm -hmm. just the way Ustream is. Well, it's right. uh, just the way the iPad camera works. Yeah. Anyway, um, so first of all, when you're uh, looking at RV parks and campgrounds, there is a wide variety, um, wide, wide variety of. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm confused by this. No, so so the, all the text is backwards. Okay, well, yeah. About, yeah, so, so that wasn't works. that way in the past, though. So. Okay. Um, so there's a wide variety of RV parks and campgrounds out there. Um, there are, I kind of distinguish RV parks and campgrounds, the difference being if they have a campfire <laughs> ring or not at the right. site, I guess. It's kind of the biggest difference. The, the universal piece. <laughs> it's kind of the biggest difference. It's um, a very slippery slope fuzzy line between what is an RV park and a right. campground. You'll just really, you'll, you'll have two parks that both call themselves a resort and they can be completely different and offer different amenities. You can go to a campground, you can go to two things that call themselves a campground and be completely different experiences. So they vary a lot. Um, definitely read reviews before you go to a campground so you get some idea of what it is. Read their website, try to see pictures, try to look at them on Google Maps to get an idea of, of what the layout is. Um, there are everything from things that look like parking lots where you're just parked side by side right. where you can literally pass a cup of coffee through your window to your neighbor. Those uh, tend not to be campgrounds. Those are tend not to be, but <laughs> we have seen places right. called campgrounds that have that, that option. Um, and then there's some where you've got a big wooded site to yourself where you might not even notice you have neighbors within, uh, within miles of you. So mm -hmm. um, they can go both ways. And everything in between, as far as privacy and amount of space between you. Some have vegetation between them. Some have nothing in between you. Some have good angling in between the RVs. Some are just straight next to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, there's privately owned RV parks and campgrounds, and then there's publicly owned ones. Privately owned ones are commercially they're in there for profit they're owned by an individual or a corporation Company, right. they might be part of a network, network or a co-op of some sort too yeah. or they might be just uh, an independently kind of uh, family-owned um, rv park um, a lot of those they tend to have they tend to cater more towards seasonal or long-term residents 
Um, some might have some what they call in route spots or transient spots that are easy to get in and out of for someone who's just passing through town for a couple nights. But a lot of their spots are put inside for people there who are there for a week to a month or more. Um, so the sites might be a little more difficult to get into. They might be tighter um, just for that. But once you get in, yeah. you're, you're expected to be in. But they offer really good weekly rates yes. and monthly rates. Yeah, the places that cater to weekly and monthly people... Um it, it's a different vibe if you if you think the first few times we did it of, of <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a different vibe going into the ones that are on the more extreme side of more trailer parkish um, that are mostly long term residents near there and you're like the only new R rig that arrives during the week but if you're trying to stay in an area for a while sometimes those are the absolute best deals because you get some incredibly good uh, weekly and monthly prices on them right. Um, you go to a more of a campground that's publicly owned or a RV park that is more geared towards vacationers, um, one that um, emphasizes their short-term or nightly rates. So they might have, maybe they list a weekly rate, but they don't actually offer a monthly rate mm -hmm. very readily. Um, those are ones that are more meant for transients, um, people passing through town, those people are on vacation. Lots, lots of fire rings and barbecue pits and... They often have 14-day limits is a very, very common Especially max. in the publicly owned yes. ones, like national, uh, state, some county parks. Those tend to have a 14-day limit. So there's a wide, wide variety on that. Uh, and the prices, too, can vary quite a bit. So a commercial campground, they can start with their... Um, We've been seeing a lot that they're starting at $30, $35 a night for a commercial RV park. Uh, but their weekly rates start to get more reasonable, maybe 200 to 250 And then their monthly rates might be 400 to 500 So they're yeah. definitely catering. The best deals are going to the seasonal stays. And then the nightly rates are what are they're making a lot of the money on for uh, people coming in and out. Mm -hmm. um, you get to uh, like a state park or a national park. They usually just have a flat nightly rate, uh, depending upon who is running the organization and what their other funding sources are. Uh, you might be getting a rate, you know, to maybe ten bucks a night, or yeah. maybe it's thirty dollars a night, so anywhere yeah. in between. Yeah, um, and depends on the amenities you're providing and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what's what's the ranges we've seen in Oregon lately? So the state parks. Yeah. So the state parks. Uh, I think at Cape Blanco we paid eighteen dollars a night, and we've seen them go up to twenty six for full hookups. Mm -hmm. Uh, you go to other states, it's going to be varied. California has yes. really high rates because they right. decided when they had their budget crunch, they passed off a lot of the costs to the, to the campers <laughs> make themselves. The, make, the, make the RVers and campers pay for the state, getting the state out of debt, and I guess it's working. Well, some parks, uh, they, they they just uh, it's just one way they stayed in business. I'd much rather pay higher and have them stay in business right. and go out of business and close yeah. down. Um, but a privately owned RV park or a commercial RV park is going to have different amenities than a public one or a campground. So a private one is going to have things like laundry, maybe a community center, a game room, uh, a pool, hot mm -hmm. tub. They probably usually have Wi-Fi, whether it works or not. Well, that's a different right. question. Um, Whereas the public ones can have that on occasion. Uh, actually, in mm -hmm. Louisiana, they have free laundry in the state park system mm -hmm. in, in Louisiana. But for the most part, they have a lot less focus on the amenities and more focus on things like trails and things Outdoor like activities. being out in nature. And because they're public... Um, public land, uh, they're not necessarily focused on trying to fit as many rigs and spots as possible to maximize the space and make as much revenue per square unit. So you get things that are spread out much more um, aesthetically pleasing with trees in between them and big gaps between sites are much more likely to be found in the public campgrounds. We, we like public campgrounds. Yes. They're, they're, they're our first choice if we can get them. Um, however, um, the public homes, like I said, usually have a 14-day limit. Aren't they? they are not meant for long-term seasonal stays. They are geared towards more recreational use versus residential use. Um, they're going to be out in nature. Um, the amenities, like Chris was saying, are going to be hiking, outdoor stuff. Maybe they have boat ramps nearby. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Maybe they are, they're on a beach or they have shore access for swimming. They're going to have things like that. Um, they're also um, going to tend to be more catered towards vacation and uh Recreation, so you might tend to have larger groups staying there. You might, while you're living in your RV, um, you might just be there with you, yourself, your spouse, maybe your family and kids. Your site next to you might have nine people. They might have a family reunion going on. They might be celebrating graduation from high school. Um, the it, last campground we were at, our neighbors were celebrating. Um, their son had just returned from uh, serving in the army in the Middle East, so it was a f big family gathering. 
and it was non-stop activity in the site next to us. They weren't rowdy or anything yeah. like that, but we were there to relax. Our neighbors right next door were out non-stop all day long, having barbecues, talking, and catching, catching up. up. Yep. Not being rowdy, but there's a lot of activity right next door. And that's just something that when you go into a campground, you just have to be prepared for, is that not everybody going to the campground is there for the same reason you are. Uh, they're not, maybe this might be their vacation. Well, it's your regular living day. You might be trying to get worked out and having a conference call and your neighbor might be doing maintenance on their generator <laughs> and running it nonstop. Right. Mm -hmm. Not that we've encountered that in the last day. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's going to be one of the annoyances of RV parks occasionally is uh, just your neighbors are there for different mm -hmm. reasons. Um, thus, they're going to have different activity levels than you do. In fact, sometimes you might have different activity yeah. levels and be the annoying one to your neighbor. Yeah. So it all is turned about fair play. Yeah. Um, Wi-Fi, that's a flaky one. Uh, yeah, Wi-Fi wi is, um, you see it advertised. It's actually become kind of one of the most prominent things, even bigger than the swimming pool. As they parks put free Wi-Fi across big signs out front. Uh, we stayed at a, a park uh, earlier this summer that had a huge free Wi-Fi sign out front. We got inside, we found out their Wi-Fi was a basically a twenty dollar discount bin router hanging on a kind of a little platform under the eaves, barely out of the rain, with a range of about fifteen feet, um, and completely unusable from literally anywhere other than standing right underneath it. And even then, it was slow. Right. So, so Wi-Fi is <laughs> definitely hit or miss. Um, that's why a lot of us depend upon cellular internet or satellite internet instead of public Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. especially at campgrounds. And when it works, it works. We love it, we rejoice, and we consider it a bonus, but we don't depend on it for those of us that need internet. Now, if you just need a little bit and you're good with that, campground Wi-Fi might be just fine. Um, and you're best off getting that. Uh, it's most likely to be usable during the day when people are out and about touring and exploring. Or the very wee hours are the best time. Yes, we love getting on Wi-Fi at 2 a.m. in the morning and getting all our stuff done because everyone else is asleep, yeah. usually. Um, other things that can be annoying at a campground is, uh, especially if your neighbors are not fellow full-timers or seasonal folks who might not know the etiquette of living in an RV park or realize how thin the walls are on an RV, uh, it's just noise. Um, they might be out talking, normal voices, and not realize that they, you can hear every word inside. Uh, we've been awoken early in the morning to having our viewers next door hosting a coffee get-together. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, right, right outside your window is, you know, somebody might be, be cooking pancakes. And um, we've, we've been awoken to, or I've heard uh, plenty of other uh, private nature noises as well coming from other Fortification of our, our neighbors. Yes. <laughs> um, we've also been um, the ones out, maybe we're out at 9 o'clock at night, well before quiet time hours, uh, enjoying some time with friends when maybe we're pouring ourselves a drink or something like that, and had the neighbor come out and say, hey, can you guys keep it down? I'm trying to get to sleep. We're, we're going to... We're leaving yeah. at 7 a.m. in the morning. This happened to be New Year's Eve. I thought that was a little silly. <laughs> yeah. But, hey, this person was leaving at 7 a.m. the next morning, was trying to get to bed early, and didn't want anyone outside her window. Um, yeah, you, okay, so, so this so is So etiquette kinda, does go both ways. Sometimes, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's fine to maybe complain about your rowdy neighbors if it's a Tuesday night. Unless the Tuesday night is New Year's Eve. You know, it's like... You, be, be open to people having their parties and celebrations and stuff right outside your windows on the rare occasions that... Uh, right, there's... definitely. Holiday weekends. Um, mm -hmm. If you if you really want peace and quiet and not to have to deal with living on other people's vacations, that's when seeking other options for campgrounds is uh, really suggested. Is go out in the, That's when you go find the boondocking out in the middle of somewhere. Maybe you go find a friend's house to stay at mm -hmm. um, and things like that if you don't want to deal with that sort of stuff. Just know that's an expectation is people are coming to campgrounds for a variety of reasons and uh, they're not always going to be in line with yours. <laughs> and it's it, sometimes you just have to take a deep breath and, uh, and, and, uh, and deal with it. And remember the <laughs> ultimate, ultimate perk is that our houses have wheels, yes. so if it's not fitting, then you can move. You can move on. Uh, some of the other annoyances, especially if you have uh, neighbors who are not regular to RVing, um, and some of the etiquettes that they might not realize is walking through your your uh, campsite. We do see complaints of this quite a bit. Um, if 
some people just might not realize that when you're parked in your RV spot, it's kind of the same as renting a hotel room or renting a, an apartment for some of us. It's mm -hmm. the same thing is our yard is part of our living space, whether mm -hmm. we're there for a night or we're there for three months. And uh, just walking, cutting through someone's space to save a few steps, unless you have permission or it's an emergency. Um, just don't just, do it. It's, it's just... It's, it's it's it is really kind of uh, tacky to be sitting at your 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 lounge chair or sitting at your desk or something and look out and there's somebody with a towel over their shoulder cutting through to get to a bathhouse and it's like no it's, you're cutting through my living room no don't do right. it <laughs> right so um, fortunately it does not happen all that it doesn't often. happen too often but you know you, you will encounter people who just aren't used to living in RV parks and. Um, and really realizing that the space around you and the space that you rented is yours for that duration of the time. And, uh, you know, cutting through other people's spaces, it's not a public area. Um, the whole park is not a public area. So, um, so yeah, there are ways to, to mitigate it. Like you, you could put up, uh, some people put up cones around their site. Some people leave their dog out all, all day to, mm -hmm. to uh, scare off people. Some people, you can strategically place your, your cars, furniture. your furniture, yeah. Um, we've done that before. We, we actually often um, angle how we park. We just actually did a blog post on this of just the different ways you can maximize your privacy by angling how you park. And that also cuts your pri your site off so nobody's going to walk through it if you're you know, going in a mm -hmm. diagonal somewhat. Yep. And when we're selecting a site, if we mm -hmm. have the option, we try to pick a site that is not on the way to something else. We yes. love being on the outer loop so yes. that uh, we're backed up to a tree line or a fence or something. So there's no reason for someone to walk through our space. We like to minimize the opportunities for someone's um, mm -hmm. bad etiquette mm -hmm. <laughs> to impact us. Yes. So th you know, those are the sort of things to, to think of when you're selecting your site is what are the opportunities for, if, if you're not amenable to someone walking through your site, is, you've got to be kind of proactive sometimes in protecting your own boundaries and yep. knowing, just keep reminding yourself, not everyone there is living in their RV or has, shares the same values that you may have. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, and of course, the campground itself has maintenance going on. Uh, the leaf blowers, I think they should be outlawed. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am very triggery by leaf blowers. So yeah, you, you get to a nice campground and it's nicely maintained. Well, it takes work to maintain mm -hmm. it. And uh, what are they supposed to do? It's not like they shut down and kick everyone out at you know 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. People are staying there overnight. They're, they don't have hours when there aren't people there. So the maintenance does have to get done at some point. So yes, you may hear leaf blowers and lawn mowers mm -hmm. and things like that. And while you may have ditched those when you gave up your house, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean when you're on the road you've ditched right. the sound of the lawn mowers and um, and maintenance going on around a campground. It's got to be done sometime. Um, or else or, or campgrounds all goats. They can get goats to do it. But then you have goat poop in your spot. Yeah, I'd rather have goat poop <laughs> than a leaf blower. It's... Uh, I don't know about that. I think I can put up with 15 minutes of leaf blower than yeah. goat poop in my spot. Yes. Man, that's <laughs> so some of the ways to deal with some of these issues is, of course, your house has wheels. If you have the option to move spots, move. Ask management if you can move spots. See if there's other spots in the campground that might be better for you. Yeah. And this is one also one reason we love campgrounds that even if they take reservations, we love campgrounds that don't give you reserved sites, so that when you get there, you could pick a site that feels right. That that you know you don't have to pull in next to the big family reunion gathering if you're looking for some peace and quiet and solitude. You can go find the spot off in the corner that has nobody camped next to it. It's a little. You lose a lot of flexibility when you arrive at a campground and they assign you. You're an A-loop site 33, and you get there, and well, oh, I guess that's where I'm at. Maybe yeah, you're in the middle of else. six campers that are all together, and they're going to be having a, a nonstop party. Right. Uh, we've reserved some sites online, like using Reserve America or something like that, and you, you pick a spot. And you get there, and you realize, oh, well, number one, the spot isn't quite what it looked like online. Uh, so it maybe doesn't have the level of privacy you thought, or isn't as big as you thought it was. And or then not you, as level. Or not as level, or you get in there and you find out you've got you know, a family reunion going on. Maybe you've got a family with a lot of kids, and you don't have kids, so you, you know. Or a, a, a dog, and we've got a cat, so if somebody's got a dog on a long leash right next door. and Who's you know. not used to cats, then, uh, and it's, and you know, sometimes <laughs> Kiki being out on her leash upsets the dog, and it just causes that dog stress, or it's constantly barking. Um, so, you know, we try to pick spots when we can on our own. And if the site doesn't work for us, we're not afraid to go and try go to change it. And try to change it, yes. Um, but you also do have to, especially on a full weekend, 
you, yeah. you don't have options sometimes. Yeah. Take, take what you get. And one thing I don't understand why some campgrounds seem, when they are checking people in and registering them, they seem to, rather than scatter them about, they just put them like one after another, filling in the loops. And mm -hmm. you get there sometimes in like sites, one through 33 are full, and then 33 through 70 are empty. Oh, I got, oh, I remember yeah. that one. We went to a fairground, I think it was in Sacramento. And they, like, assigned everyone right next to each other. There were literally seven RVs parked right next to each other. And then the and rest then of the line The rest open. of the campground was completely open with no other explanation for why. And it was like, okay, it would bring more peace and harmony to everybody to have an extra just, 10 feet in between the Yeah, just the go RVs. every other site, you know, do only yeah. odd numbers or something. I, I don't know why some check-in people just do it that way, but um, I, if you're watching this video and you're work camping and registering RVs, Spread them out. Try to spread them out. If possible. <laughs> if possible. Um, but of course, if you do find yourself in a camping situation and you don't have the option to move, um, shut the windows, play some music, um, meet your neighbors. Sometimes just meeting the neighbors, yep. you might get invited to the party. Yep. That's happened for us, and that makes it a lot better. Or or, or they give you the invitation of saying, hey, we're kind of loud and rowdy, but just you know, give us a little heads up if we're getting kind of in, in your space. And that just opens the door so that later on you've got the invite, you know who to walk up to and say, hey, you know, it is 1145 and either give me a beer or can you maybe turn down the music? Right. Yeah, it's like um, over 4th of July weekend, yeah. we picked a campground. Um, we tried to pick one with the least amount of spots in it. And sure enough, we had two families out there having their 4th of July celebration right next to us. And we just got to know them, met them, and both of the families invited us over to join in their celebrations, which was great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because they had a personal rapport with us, we felt they were a little more respectful of our our, our time and our... Yeah. And we, we told them, hey, we know this is a holiday weekend. Right. You know, have fun. We're not here to spoil your weekend. We don't want you to restrain. You know, it, sometimes you just have to realize that... You know, I, I do wish they cleaned up all the beer bottles yeah, and I did burnt up fireworks they left behind that we ended up cleaning up in the campground. But, you know, they had a hell of a party and they were fairly nice people. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, getting to know your neighbors helps them realize that, you know, they're being loud. They're disrupting a real person that they now have a connection to. Right. Um, if it really is a problem and you think that they are violating camp rules, you know, if quiet time starts at 10, I, I wouldn't go at 10.01 and report oh, them. God, yeah. But if they're still going on at like 11 or, so, or something like that, that's what uh, park managers and camp hosts are for. Um, mm -hmm. Especially if there's alcohol involved, it may not be the best idea to go up and uh, confront them yourselves. Mm -hmm. But let the park hosts know. Sometimes they might not know that there's a... a or, or actually, sometimes we, we, we've seen this, is sometimes they're waiting for an actual report. They've got it already on their radar. They just need to know that somebody else is being bothered, and then that, that's their excuse to take action and intervene. Um, you're doing the camp host a favor if, you're, if you pass on somebody who is, is mm -hmm. really going up, above and beyond the limits mm -hmm. of what would be good, good neighborly. Mm -hmm. All right. So we got one little section left to cover here, and then we'll be turning this over to Q&A. Uh, &A. So if you would please go ahead and start queuing up your questions in the chat box over there on the right-hand side, and we'll get to those right after we finish up this next session. So go ahead and start queuing up those questions, and we can move right into answering your questions. Um, so uh, some considerations in booking and planning to have the best possible experience. Mm -hmm. okay. um, number one, um, if you're going to be going into a park for a while, um, it's always best if you can stay there first or check it out in person first before committing long term. Right. There's nothing worse than getting to a campground and realizing it is just not your cup of tea and you've got a three month commitment. Yeah, we've seen people who've run into that and have had to walk out on leaving deposits behind yeah. or um, and sometimes it's unavoidable. I mean, sometimes to get a spot in a location that's in high demand during high season, you have to kind of commit in advance. But try to do your research. That's going to be your style of park. Yeah, and and you know, go go do a scouting run the year before if you're like trying to plan something out. We know people who you know go and like either visit just for a day or two, or just do a big long car trip and scout the places they plan to be the next season. So they really know what they're getting into. And maybe even have a, a binder of, of write down the sites that are most appealing to you and things like that. So that when you're, if you are trying to plan and make long-term reservations, which is sometimes smart if you really want seasonal things, um, you know, you've got real information to go on and, and not just uh, right. uh, luck of the draw. Right. And, you know, re online reviews, reading other bloggers' reports of where they've been. 
talking to friends and things like that. Those are all great ways to find out about great campgrounds. But keep in mind, everyone is different. And just because we had a good experience at a campground or a bad experience mm -hmm. doesn't mean you will. Right. And um, it, so you have to kind of think for yourself. If, if privacy isn't a concern for you, you're probably not going to have the same considerations right. that we do for a, a, a campground. Well, and, and just even just our, our own styles have changed. Because right. when, we, when we were in the tiny 16 and 17 foot trailers, uh, the outside was really our living room. You know, we, the, our, our outside space was really important to us, and we did not want a next door neighbor rig with their windows looking down right on top of us. So we would go to great extremes to um, have. Uh, some wall of vegetation outside of us. Now that we've got a bus, you know, we've got more space inside. When we close our windows, we are pretty sealed off, so we're a lot more tolerant mm -hmm. of being next to somebody else's RV. We still don't like it, but it's it's our preferences and what we're open to has changed quite a bit. Right. And also, when we're seeking out campgrounds, one of the features we do look for is how much of an option is first come, first serve going to be. Uh, do we have to pick our site in advance? And if we do, I'll, I'll go to more extremes and looking at the sites. Um, I'll, you know, a lot of online booking services now have pictures of the site. You can go to, I think it's campsitephotos.com yep. or something like that, where you can go look at the sites. I'll go on Google, uh, Google Maps and uh, turn on satellite view and look at the campground from the sky. And just get really a good sense if that site is going to be amenable. But even so, I mean, at this last campground we're at, I looked online, I looked at, did all that, and had we booked the site that I thought we wanted, yeah, we would have got there. We couldn't, you can't see on those sort of things just how unlevel it was. Right. So I'm glad we didn't. We got there, uh, first of all, and were able right. to pick out the site that worked for us best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, I think, wraps up our, our what we planned to talk about. Now we'll go ahead yeah. and start taking your questions. Um, let's scroll up here. A few here. good questions coming in we here. Got one. Um, how, How long, long is, is your bus? And she asks, or he asks, uh, I'm looking at a 40-foot fifth wheel. Do you find that you're restricted from a lot of parks to RV parks for being longer? So our bus is 35 feet. Right. Uh, and one reason we went 35 feet is we wanted to maintain maximum flexibility for going places. Uh, keeping in mind that a lot of older RV parks and campgrounds were built when the max highway length was mm -hmm. 35. Right. So those are back, we like public parks, so a lot of them were built back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, so we hardly ever run into places that we're completely restricted from. Uh, there's Sometimes there's quite a few sites that, that we won't fit into, sites that are just tiny trailer sized. Um, and But 35 I, is kind of a sweet spot. Um, as you get bigger... 40 and 45 starts Especially with to, the fifth wheel, because you gotta you yeah. got to count. Sometimes it's not just a spot that you can't get into. It's maneuvering around the park and getting mm -hmm. to your spot. So when you add in a large vehicle pulling a 40-footer, um, you do start to restrict yourself. Um, the larger you go, especially above 40. Now, newer campgrounds, are, they are building them larger for the larger rigs, because a lot of them are being built to very large sizes. Uh, but you are kind of... And it, it does increase your level of homework. I mean, we, we know people who do amazing amounts of state park camping and boondocking and hitting all sorts of interesting and unique places with absolutely huge rigs, but they spend a ton of time scoping things out and even getting down to, to doing aerial reconnaissance with satellite images to the exact angles of making turns and stuff just to determine that they'll be able to get into places. So... You can, um, yes, you can find spots with a larger rig. Yeah. It just reduces them. Sometimes a campground might only have two or three spots that can handle a larger setup. Right. Um, so one thing that, you know, when we went to a larger um, RV and went, we decided 35 was the absolute max we were comfortable with, um, and there have been several times that we've had a wider choice of sites. We've gotten better sites because of it. We've walked up to campgrounds and said, hey, do you happen to have a spot? And they'll ask how size they are. We'll say, oh, we're 35. They say, oh, yeah, no problem. We can fit you in. If you're 40, now nah, we couldn't do it. <laughs> right. and, and then also a whole lot depends on just your own skill mm -hmm. and comfort in backing and, and maneuvering mm -hmm. a bigger rig. Because you know, we, we have seen people who can make a fifth wheel work, you know, do amazing things, you know, duck in between two trees with, you know, one pass and, you know, they're in. And we've seen other people go back and forth for 45 minutes, which is absolutely one of the most horrible annoyances to have that be right outside your window. Or entertaining. It, 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 can, it can be entertaining 
for the first five or ten minutes, but when you see somebody literally just going back and forth, back and forth, and they have no idea how to back around a tree, and then they right. get pinned and they're stuck and they don't know how to get out from where they are. Yeah. Meanwhile, their diesel engines <laughs> running, and you're trying idling, to have a conference call. Right, and they're um, idling right outside yes, your window. Yes. In fact, we almost were unsure if we were able to do this chat because we had someone idling their diesel <laughs> engine right outside our window for about 20 or 30 minutes before this chat. We're like, oh, goodness, please, please no. Stop, no. <laughs> so, yeah. This, this... Which, which brings us to a point of campground etiquette that I think we skipped over. Is when when you're – don't idle in a campground. Don't – like, if you've got things you need to do, um, like hitching, your, hitching up your toad or doing your lights check and stuff like that – you know, drive out to the dump station or drive out, like, to the access road. There's usually a much better place to do all those chores than right in front of other campers. Or turn campsites. off your engine yeah, if or you can. Turn off your uh, we know diesel engines prefer to be on and don't like to be turned on and off. And But also, please do be considerate of people around you. No one wants to be listening, li to an engine listening and smelling and, the fumes longer than yeah. they need to be. Uh, okay, next question was, uh, what's the best resource for finding good nature base, i.e. not Walmart boondocking yeah. spots? Um, there's a couple of resources. There's a website called freecampsites.net. Um, that is a great resource. Um, our U.S. Public Lands app helps with that. Um, if you check, um, if you're on the, the embed on our, if you're on our website during this chat, if you scroll down to the bottom, I've listed some resources there. And we actually did a video chat last December on picking campgrounds and routing. And if you go to that one, there's a lot of resources with our recommendations for apps and websites. And uh, we're about to refresh our Finding Campgrounds and yeah. uh, blog post. So stay tuned with the blog. I should hopefully get that done here in the next couple of weeks. You should see that online as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a lot of uh, update that as well. But yeah, freecampsites.net is probably the top resource yeah. for finding nature-based. Uh, what is our experience of being a camp host? We have never been a camp host. Yeah, we were. We were what well, we technically were was uh, lighthouse hosts at Cape Blanco. Um, the, the camp host job, for those who don't, don't aren't quite familiar with it, is usually the person who is kind of the watch keeper for the for the campground they go around and keep track of um, which sites are full make sure they have got their little tags and have paid for everything and then usually after the people leave they might be responsible for cleaning the site and doing a little bit of, uh, of cleanup work checking the fire ring and stuff like that and sometimes they have even even more duties um, we've never actually had that job and we it's not necessarily and really called to us much we yeah a lot of it. a lot of those require that you be on call i mean you might only do three or four hours of work a day but you have to kind of be on call for when people arrive and things like that and you're the emergency contact for yeah the that's not suitable because we're working um you know we have regular jobs as well that we're doing and developing apps and that's a little too disruptive to our workflow so it's not something that fits for us but uh, a lot of we, folks do we, enjoy. We know a lot of people who thoroughly enjoy doing. Uh, they love hosting. the social aspect mm -hmm. of it. For us, when I'm not we, like when we're doing lighthouse hosting, we were on duty three or four hours a day. We were at the lighthouse giving tour guides, and we were home. We were off duty, off duty. and uh, didn't have any. You know, there was clearly on and off time, and that that works better for us. Mm -hmm. Um, because we do have other work projects that we have to attend to, mm -hmm. like hosting these chats and, <laughs> and uh, doing yeah. our mobile internet stuff. Yeah. So. Uh, are you able to negotiate a better campground price? For not not for public places, but for private often. Maybe sometimes. Well, yeah. So, so yeah. May, I, mean, I don't think we on, ever on, have. Um, we well, we've done things with. Um, you can sometimes negotiate bartering for services. Yes. If you have a skill or trade, you might be able to barter. And but, also, you you've also can often get things that where they have the discount clubs like Passport America prices. Yeah, but that's not negotiating. That's well, using... no, 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 no. <laughs> but, but but where they'll give you that price that is only good for like two or three days, they'll give it to you. Oh, you can keep using that price for as long as you stay. And we have had that. Happen we have that. Us, we yes. have had that happen. Right. If it's low season and the spots are all empty, you might have some room to say, hey, you know, I'd like to stay here a week. Can I? Keep yeah. the Passport America price. Or can I, um, you know, I'm not a Passport America member. Would you extend the price? Mm -hmm. um, or will, you know, sometimes you might be able to get a good monthly rate. But if, you know, if they're full, you're not going to get have money. I mean, <laughs> supply and demand. There, right? But, you know, if, if you see the campgrounds empty and they're, they don't have a lot of business, you might be able to. Yeah. Um, discuss safety and protective issues in a campground. We have an attack cat that defends us. Um for the most part, campgrounds actually kind of have a built-in neighborhood watch. There's, there's of course, a camp host, but also campers tend to keep an eye out for each other pretty yeah, well. Get to, we, we, employ, we get to know our neighbors, mm -hmm. if we, especially if we're there for a while, so that you've got people you know um, who know of you and you know of them, and you kind of have a watch out for each other when you're gone. Mm -hmm. um, we have never felt, in eight years on the road, have never felt threatened or intimidated or even scared in an RV park or campground. No. 
No, I, I mean, I guess like some of the the first times we did the more trailer park style places with everybody else is residential except us. Um, felt a little intimidating the first time walking around until we got to meet our neighbors and they're like, oh, cool, you, you, you're neat people and you know you, you get to swap stories a little bit. But yeah, we really it, it's it's people are. I mean, mostly lock your good. doors. Don't. I mean, we close our windows and things like that when yeah. we're gone so that all our stuff isn't on display. Mm -hmm. Um, but I really, I don't think there, I mean, other than using common sense and if it doesn't feel safe, your house that, has wheels. That, that is the ultimate there is like, if, if you have a bad feeling in the pit of your stomach, mm -hmm. move, you know, even if you're, even if it's the middle of the night, even if you have no place else to stay, just move and find a rest area or a road pull out mm -hmm. or someplace else that does feel better for you. Um, cause trust your instincts. That's just the way to go. Uh, what's the best surge protector for shore power? Um, we haven't we haven't tested a lot, a lot well, of them, yeah, so the, I can't the, say what's best. We can tell you what we use. The, the, <laughs> the best the best one is is having one. You know, not having one is 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 putting yourself at risk, particularly if you're in lightning prone environments or places where the electrical is not up to snuff. Um, but they they have, you know, just a, a basic plug in. You can either get one that's built in built in and permanently hardwired, and those are a little bit pricey, you know, two three hundred dollars, mm -hmm. or you can get one that just plugs into the pedestal and then you plug into that. It's kind of you know a bit more disposable. Those They're are, not going to last quite as long, but um, those, yeah, those about are about hundred. So Depending if you need thirty or fifty amp. Yeah. Uh, Progressive End Industries brand yeah. is one that's frequently yeah. referenced as being uh, a high end, respected yeah. brand. I've never I've never heard of anybody who had anything bad to say about a search suppressor, other than wishing right. they had one when they had no. they didn't. Uh, okay. Next question was how much time do you allow before you scout and reserve your next spot? 20 minutes? Uh, some, sometimes we'd yeah, like really. to steer by serendipity and just drive. Um, often we'll, we'll at least scout around what the options are down the road. Mm -hmm. So we'll know that, okay, there's like four campgrounds that are appealing. And we'll see the first one we drive by. If it calls to us, we might pull into it. If not, we'll just know we keep going until we've got, okay, option four might right. be our planned last resort. Like if none of the others work, we know at least we can right. stay there for well, a while. Well, we will look out enough to know, are we going to have a problem pulling into a site or do we need to make a reservation? Mm -hmm. So, like, we're now doing about a three-week tour up the Oregon coast. And we're, we're looking out a week or two in advance of what our potentials are. And I look to see, am I going to have a problem pulling in? If I notice that there's, so we're staying in a lot of state parks, mm -hmm. we can look on Reserve America and see, have the uh, are they all booked up? Or, you know, are there only three or four spots left? We take that into consideration if we should make a reservation or not. And particularly uh, for weekends. And weekend. often, often we'll plan, if we want to stay someplace for a weekend, we'll tr plan to arrive on Thursday. Just to get so the best spot, the, if it's a first come, first serve yeah, first 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 park. Um, if there's some place that we know we want to be in advance, like, um, oh, let's say we want to go to Austin for South by Southwest, which we're not planning to do this year, uh, but we have in the past, we will look three or four four, five, six months in advance and try to get a reservation if we know there's some place we want to be. Um, if we want to be going in for a family reunion or something that's date specific, then we do the research in advance and find some place where we can be. Otherwise, we like to route by serendipity and um, kind of sometimes it's we, we leave in the morning and don't know where we're going to end up. And sometimes we have reservations a week or two in advance. Um, Is the membership camp thing worth it for discount campgrounds? Depends on what you mean by the membership thing. Yeah, there's a whole range of membership clubs. There's everything from things like Passport America, Good Sam, FMCA, Escapees. Escapees is kind of a discount thing. Um, Passport America is like 44 bucks, 42 bucks a year, and it gives you 50% off at a bunch of uh, commercial RV parks. Mm -hmm. um, we find them useful when we're moving in between spots if we need access to... Dump and potential Wi-Fi and stuff. They usually laundry. are they usually are full service campgrounds with right. a lot of amenities, and we will use them. And you only need to stay in like two parks a year to to uh, make Passport America work because you know, normally these are the commercial parks that are like forty or fifty bucks a night, and then you're paying the Passport America rate that might be you know twenty bucks, twenty bucks, and you stay for two nights, you take advantage of all the amenities, and it didn't really cost you all that right. much. So and it's paid for itself in yep. that one stay. Yep. All the other ones like a. Um, Good Sam and FMCA, they give you a 10% discount, and you're joining for other reasons, so yeah. look at those if those those groups make sense for you. Uh, Escapees is a great organization. Um, they offer a lot of things. They do a lot of advocacy for RVers. They look on top to make sure that full-timers and, and frequent RVers are, you know, accounted for in mm -hmm. things like voting. They've stood up for voter rights for nomads and insurance and things right. like that. They offer mail forwarding services. 
Uh, they have a great magazine, and they also happen to have their own network yeah, of parks discounts. where they offer great rates, and they also have 15% to 50% discounts. So they're worthwhile, and they're yeah. running a special right now. I think it's $29, $29 to join. $29, $30 yeah. right yeah. now to join, so they're kind of really worthwhile. Yeah. And, and then at the other extreme, you've got the memberships like Thousand Trails and stuff that Coast are, to Coast and yeah, that are that are thousands of dollars to buy a membership, and then you get really really cheap camping but is it a you know certain you know some place actually often it's, it's free camping at a network of parks um but do your homework first before you sign up for them they're they're really good deals if they fit your style exactly and you take advantage of them but we know a lot of people who end up spending a lot of money for memberships that they mm -hmm. never end up using Right. So with a thousand trails and those sorts of memberships where you're, you're going to be putting out a lot of information, a lot of money and restricted to a, a what we the way we've always put it is if we find ourselves staying in places where those those campgrounds are and they would be great options, we would be open to buying one. I can tell you in eight years on the road, it hasn't fit our style. Right. But we know other full timers who they're optimizing for living as affordably as possible on the road. They don't really care where they're going because yeah. they're not routing by people that they want to see or job opportunities or things like that. Um, they find them a really worthwhile way to bring down their, their annual costs and they find them really worthwhile. Right. So they just hop from one park to another in the system and they're paying either free or $4 a mm -hmm. night or something like that. And it's, it, it, it's great. Just do your homework first and don't don't sign go to the sales pitch, but don't sign up at the sales pitch no matter how many bonuses right. they try and to offer uh, you. Uh, a lot of the Thousand Trail memberships can be bought used. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be transferred some of the older plans and you get a lot better deals if you buy them from someone who's looking to sell them. So do that instead. Uh, look into that option. Uh, for us, we've never been tempted. Yep. Uh, we've only been to 2,000 trail parks and that was visiting friends, I think. And yeah, they're not our style. Yeah. They're not our style of park. Yeah. Um, do you use your toad to scope out boondocking sites? Sometimes. Yeah, we have done that. Um, it is it. We, we more often use our iPads and Google and uh, Google Earth and Google Maps and Apple Maps and comparing multiple satellite images and stuff to do that. But that doesn't really work through tree cover too well. So ditching the toad and scouting ahead can be a very smart thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that most campgrounds have enough room to unhook your toad at the campground, or do you unhook it before? Most campgrounds are designed for RVers, and they usually have a space to unhook. I don't think we've really had a case where, I mean, if they if they do, they usually list it on their website yeah. or tell you that when making a reservation. Well, and, and also, so know how long it takes to unhook your toad because we, we we have a toad that we can drop in just two minutes and and be yeah, driving we, we separately get, so we right. could very easily unhook without blocking traffic we have seen other people who seems like it takes them 15 or 20 minutes just to unhook their toad and if that's you do it before you get to the track where you might be blocking right. or, or look at google maps and see yeah. um you know look yeah. at it on satellite view and just see how much room there is uh, on the approach um See, there's a specific question about options in Melbourne, Florida. Um, if you go look at our past um, posts on Melbourne, Florida, or look in rvparking.com, this is for yeah. Greg and Margie. Um, we have all our reviews for everywhere we've stayed in Melbourne. Yeah, so so if you go look at three, that. Three yeah. Or four yeah, if I'm not going to get into yeah. specific mm -hmm. campgrounds here. Um, I'm concerned about boot donking within city limits with no Walmarts. Are there challenges with this in certain areas? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's called stealth camping is what you're trying to do by parking within the city limits. It's a style of boondocking. Um, you can do it. You can park on some streets, know what the local ordinances are, look at options, use resources like overnightrvparking.com. Um, but it, it, if you do your homework, there, there's a, if you're stealthy enough that you've just got like a, a, a container van style camper, you can get away with it almost anywhere. If you're not, if you're much more obviously an RV, there's usually places that you could find where other RVers do it. Um, it's a, it's a difficult style of camping in the sense that you really can't, you know, you, you can't put your slides out. Usually some streets you can, you can't, you can't put your lawn furniture out. You can't really make yourself home. You got to be ready to move if, you, if right. you, know, you really come you, along. You got to make it look like you're not living there. Right. If you're not in some place that officially allows it. So, but, but it's a great way, particularly if you're in some place for a short period of time, it's a great way to get into the heart of a city where there might not be camping. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, we often receive deadlines while driving and have to pull over to accomplish some work, some grocery stores with Wi-Fi outside other ideas. Um, Find places with Wi-Fi, play with parking. Uh, Lowe's have usually have Wi-Fi. 
Um, but, you know, carry your own Wi-Fi with you. Have a good cellular plan so that you never have to be dependent upon public resources because you just never know if you're going to be able to get them. Yeah. If you are if you need Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, it's, 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 even if you have um, a plan that you have to pay per, you know, pay as you go or pay per gigabyte, mm -hmm. if you have an emergency thing, like, you know, you've got a, a client that calls or you've got work that needs to be done and you can't go out and find Wi-Fi, well, at least you've got a way to do it. Right. Hopefully it's worth it. Right. And for more information on, uh, on, on ideas, do check our, our, our new book. We just spent three months writing it. It goes over everything that you need to know about uh, in, living with minimal connections as and, well. and, yeah. and, and working with uh, this available ebook on rvmobileinternet.com. You can pick up the book in ebook or print. And it kind of this. goes to the next question. Any updated opinions on the cell phone boosters? And uh, yes, yeah, we, we did. Just... We've done an extensive series and testing um, on rvmobileinternet.com. It's part of um, we are now doing a lot of our internet testing and stuff like that. We started a new premium membership group called the Mobile Internet Aficionados. Um, uh, because we're spending so much time writing information and getting asked questions like this, uh, we're going to start dedicating more time to writing content on it. And um, obviously that costs time and money for us. So we started a membership site. It's currently doing its uh, you know, initial launch price of $39 a year, and you'll get deeper access to, to all that sort of stuff. We'll publish things like the booster reviews we just did. Um, went to members only, and at some point down the road, we'll probably open right. those more out to the general public. Yeah. So. That's a good thing there. Mm -hmm. um, how much bandwidth do you typically use per month? That is also a very tricky question because it varies so much. It really depends upon what we're doing, how many OS updates we need. Um, just how much work we're doing. Yeah, what type yeah. of work projects we're on. Um, so it, it varies a lot. So we have a very versatile arsenal to set up so for that. So we can dial up and down our needs per month. Right. And, we pay and uh, there's a, if you're not tracking it right now, there is uh, most of the major carriers are offering double the data on larger buckets that uh, really change how we all assemble our arsenal. So October is the month of reconsidering your bandwidth uh, setup. And uh, we just did a hour long video talk with our mobile internet aficionados. And uh, we just did a 4,000 word uh, article going over it all. So um, yes. if those are topics that are interesting to you and you depend on mobile internet for your lifestyle, uh, we do encourage you to consider joining there, the, there's the quite, MIA. quite a few free stuff, free resources and some paid resources. Mm -hmm. Just go to rvmobileinternet.com. Um, um, Washing and retaining your rig in parks, any problems? Washing, always double check the rules because a lot of parks have very limited and very expensive water and uh, some of them even have in their fine print that they are entitled to charge you a huge fine if they catch you washing your rig. And some cities actually have uh, mm -hmm. have like anti-washing rules because of water conservation. Right. So it can vary a lot by the locality, by the campground. Mm -hmm. Some campgrounds that allow just because it's annoying to the neighbors and they've right. had complaints. <clears throat> Some allow you to bring in a professional um, crew to come in and wash, but mm -hmm. not you. And a lot of RVers also have uh, gotten into the um, dry waterless, water. the dry wash. Right, to get around that. Polish things to keeping their rigs clean. Yeah, as far as maintenance and doing mechanical work, a lot of RV parks, especially commercial ones, do forbid you from doing maintenance in the RV park because mm -hmm. they don't want to become a garage. Yeah. Yep. So. But again, ask too because a lot of them really don't mm -hmm. mind. <laughs> Uh, in your experience, is the campground staff helpful in resolving issues with other campers? We've honestly not had too many issues with yeah. campers, and none that well, we usually we tend to resolve them ourselves just by getting to know our neighbors and talking to them, or we decide just we're going to move. You know, we're not going to extend, gonna, or we're just going to you know close the windows and do our own thing and ignore it. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> all right. Um, have you ever been turned away from a campground due to the age of your RV? Um, we have a 1961 vintage bus. So if you're not familiar. This is a model of our, our, our RV. We're, we kind of defy the, uh, the old rules just because we're vintage, uh, classic, restored, maintained. So a lot of the reasons why they keep the older ones out, it's very clear that we have upkept ours. Um, and, and I mean, but ours does, it's got an old worn out paint job on the outside yeah. and stuff. So it, so we've had once in the three years. Of the it was bus. the host who had a problem. The owner loved us. Though. Yes. Yes. So that was, that's kind of interesting. The, the host, when we pulled in was like, oh, I wouldn't have let this in here, but I guess you're here. I got to let you stay. Then the owner of the park He's like, oh my gosh, by. I love vintage buses. You're welcome. Yeah. You're tell welcome. your friends. We'd love to have more vintage buses here. And it's like, well, talk to your host because mm -hmm. he's got a problem with older rigs. I wanted to kick us out. Um, but for the most part, if you've got a well-maintained rig, um, you know, we know people who have old uh, Prevos and Newells and stuff that is that was high-end when they were new. Even when they're 20 years old, they still look 
high end and they're never going to get turned away. It's just the things you run across that are, you know, having peeling fiberglass and kind of if it looks eyesore-ish, then you stand the risk. But public parks don't turn people away. So that's yeah, public parks, parks allow everything. Um, mm-hmm. Just look at the rules before mm-hmm. you go there. Um, mm-hmm. Most of them, if they have those rules, they post yeah. them on their websites. And, you know, if it's there, you know. Either we'll sometimes, if, if we need to be in an area and the only option is an RV park that has that rule, we'll contact them in advance. We've sent them video tours of our RV, and we usually get get uh, yeah. the, get invited anyway. Our, our, yeah, they, they're like, oh, cool, and the video has a, a little bit of our cat in it. And they're like, oh, your cat's so cool, too. And so, you know. But we, if you have a truly old RV that's in disrepair, yes, expect to have problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, um, you know, you need a roadworthy RV to stay in a lot of the, it looks the, the, good. the commercial. Anything that has resort in the name is where you're going to have more of yeah, a problem. The more haughty toddy yes. they seem to be catering to, but then you don't want to be there anyway. Oh, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to go ahead. We're, we got two more questions that just came in. We're going to mm-hmm. wrap up with those. Uh, we've been speaking for an hour, and we had an hour one before this. My throat's getting dry. Oh, um, yeah. So these will be the last questions. Um, and. Um, Oh, so we got it. I'll, ask, I'll answer uh, the, third I'll get the third one. So she can answer for herself because her birthday okay. tomorrow. Um, do, you, do we gravitate towards campgrounds or risk the unknown? Um, known campgrounds. We oh. like we like new and unusual. So we we usually risk going to new places because and checking new places. Our, our house has wheels. If we don't like it, we can move. Right. Uh, the other one is, do we mostly use resort showers or our bus? We use our bus as shower exclusively. Um, I like having my own shower. We've got it set up exactly with the way we want it. I don't like having to get dressed to go outside and get naked to talk, take a shower. <laughs> they get dressed to come back in and get ready for the day. I like to just walk into my shower and use it. And our tanks are large enough. We can do 10 days without thinking about it. So we use our showers. Yes, love our shower. Um, and the last question that we're going to be taking, uh, please, no more questions. We, uh, we just uh, are out of energy and time this time. Um, is how old Kiki is. She actually turns six years old tomorrow. Tomorrow is her birthday. Send her presents. She wants presents. So she has been with us the entire time. Um, so, okay, we're tired, we're exhausted. Thank you for joining us. Wow, it was, I think this was a record um, a video chat. We thank you for joining us. We got how many people peaked up? 77, I think. I know. Thank you guys so much for joining yes, us. We really fun. enjoy these. Um, we do these as a gift. Uh, we do accept donations, however. Um, if you've enjoyed these and you get uh, uh, use out of it. Uh, we are gifting you our time and experience, and we do enjoy that. Uh, but we also do enjoy a bottle of wine, and we'd like <laughs> to say thank you. Uh, yeah. There is a donate button at the bottom of our web page, on every page. Uh, send us a little ka Buy our book. Buy our apps. Yeah. Um, we have the No Excuses series that goes over a lot of the logistics, so check that out. That's free to read online. And, and uh, Thank you so much. We'll yes. see, you, see you next time. Next time we'll be on live stream. Next time we're going to try a live stream. We should have no ads. Um, yep. And hopefully be a better experience for everybody. Um, so, Bye. thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>